February 22nd, 2018. We're at the University of California, Berkeley School of Law to talk about with Malcolm Philly and Jonathan Simon. My name is Diego Simon Quiroz. He's Mariano Sicardi, both from the University of Buenos Aires, Argentina. 25 years ago, Malcolm Philly and Jonathan Simon published a set of path-breaking contributions that highlight the rising prominence of new panology practices and actuarial uh, justice politics. This interview focuses in the story and the main ideas of those articles. Malcolm Field is a Claire Sanders Clement Dean's Professor of Law at Ball Hall School of Law, Uniform, University of California, Berkeley. He's a distinguished professor in criminal law, criminal process and court functioning. Also, he wrote several papers related to these topics and he's the author of the books The Process, the Punishment and Court Reform on Trial, among others. On the other hand, Jonathan Simon is an Adrian E. Cregan Professor of Law and Director of the Center for the Study of Law and Society, University of California, Berkeley. He's also a distinguished professor in criminal law, criminal process and criminology. He's the author of several papers and books related to these issues and he's the author of the books Poor Discipline, Governing Through Crime and most recently Mass Incarceration and Trial at uh, forecoming in a translation in mm -hmm. into Spanish. Okay. Malcolm and Jonathan in 1992 had published one of the most important articles in the penal field called The New Penology and in 1994 another article titled Actuarial Justice. Their full CVs could be found in the website of the School of Law Berkeley. The interview has three parts. The first part we name it the origins of the work on the new panology and actuarial justice, the second, theoretical frameworks, concepts and variations, and the third, the role of the new panology. For the first part, where and when did you meet each other uh, for the first time, and how many papers did you write together about this and other topics? <coughs> Age first. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we, that's, that's right. We, <laughs> I met Jonathan when he was a student here, an advanced student, and uh, I always viewed him as a colleague rather than a student. And uh, this was our, the new penology was our first paper, and uh, we wrote Actuarial Justice, and then we've written a couple Just of other variations on that theme uh, for uh, Feshrift, for Stan Cohen, and, and I think one or two other things. Yeah, it's, and we always intended to go back and circle back and write a book, which was probably a mistake, you know, not to have, since a number of good books have been written. And um, but um, we can't complain about the, the yeah. influence that the article had as you know has, as an article. Um, I remember Malcolm arriving sort of toward the end of my graduate studies here, and it was from my point of view we already had an embarrassing rich uh, embarrassment of riches of scholars of criminal justice, uh, empirical scholars, which was very rare at the time. We had Jerry, we had Shelley Messenger, we had uh, Caleb Foote still, and, and, sort of a, and then Frank Zimmering. I came within a year yeah, or two of, of Malcolm's, yeah. and I was one of the few students around all that interested in crime, so I really felt like I had um, lucked out. I mean, uh, it was a very, because this was essentially the resonant remnants of the old crim school, plus these new uh, uh, new hires or relative but who are very senior people like Malcolm uh, and Frank and it was a great time to be doing criminal justice here Malcolm then brought in the Guggenheim seminar which is maybe where this paper was first yeah, I, I think th I can tell we, him about yeah. how it was to see yeah, yeah I think we gave a first version of it in conference a little conference that was somewhere here in the East we Bay gave, we gave it was 1919 the, the, the first conference so, yes. or 1982 the, yeah, the, the paper, year the of the paper paper. At 92 the pa the conference may have been 90 or it was 90 or 91 the conference our audience it was a conference on on how to keep prisons lower and our mm -hmm. and our audience it was over in Clark Kirk campus right. and our audience what consisted of all the wardens in the state prisons in California, plus the head, the top leadership of mm -hmm. uh, of the Department of Corrections, 
plus a variety of other academics and uh, and students and so on. But it, it was it was it was a, it was a conference that we co-sponsored with the Department of Corrections, and they were bewildered by what we said. Although the commentator <laughs> I still remember was uh, the very distinguished uh, uh, criminal justice scholar uh, Al Blumstein, who. Mm. was amazed at what John Simon said. I still remember that, too. <laughs> he was very nice too. about it. <laughs> yes. Uh, it was very funny because well, Bloomstein is a truly a, a gracious person. And uh, I think I literally said something, and I was appealing to what I thought was the practical sympathies of the audience as criminal justice you know, believers, practitioners, that they wanted to be involved in changing people's lives, not, quote, rearranging baggage in an airport. And it turns out that Bloomstein <laughs> no, had literally not, written his not, dissertation. Not rearranging back. You so you're talking about you're talking <laughs> about air traffic controllers, oh. planes coming in and planes right. coming leave, <laughs> and not caring where they go. <laughs> and and, and he, he had written his dissertation. And Al on said, "How did you know my very first paper <laughs> was on airport? <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, control." <laughs> he could easily have been affronted at that. He was very nice. Yeah. About it. <laughs> you were I, surprised that you knew at that time. You were. In different university, Correct. university. You were here. You were in Michigan, That's and right. then in Miami. No, you, how, were, you, how you were. You were clerking. Were I you? was still. Well, I think maybe when we first started talking about oh, I was clerking, and okay. then I transitioned. Okay, okay. I got the job at Michigan. What while did I was you clerking. decide to 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 join and write this paper together? Well, I'll tell you. My, I, I'll tell you. My, we, we probably have different histories. Uh, my. My, f the paper that I first was going to write for this conference. Uh, had to do with shifting budgets. It would have been good because I wanted to point out that the problem with with uh, with uh, penal policy in the in the in the states across America is that county judges sentence people to state prison rather than jail. And one of the reasons they do is that if they sentence them to jail, the counties pay, and if they sentence them to state prison, states pay, and they're county judges, and so they have. They have the correctional free a, an instinct to, to sho shove off the cost to somebody else, and so I was saying I was saying the solution to this is to have is to have state judges and a state system, and there is we are slowly in in a hundred years we will have a state a state system rather than a county state, but uh, and then it dawned on me that uh, uh, that uh, we could do something better, and Jonathan and I had been talking about this along with Shelley Messenger, who who was a unindicted co-conspirator on this paper, I think. Um, and it goes back, and so it, and it, it was an idea that had been in the back of my mind, and then this provided the opportunity. Uh, Jonathan and Shelley were very excited about Foucault. Mm -hmm. Shelley, Shelley had identified the problem of coming up with models that are collectivities that don't capture anybody, any person in you know, reality, but just a construct. And, and then responding to the construct, like for the career criminal thing. Uh, but, but Jonathan got interested in Foucault and, and the, I, had, I came at it from a different matter. Years before, I had, I had been doing two things. I had been taking Guido Calabrese's, Calabrese's uh, class in torts, just right after he had published his famous book, The Cost of Accidents, mm -hmm. Where he argued that 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 the new approach in in, in tort law was uh, the law management economics. of accidents. He was part of yes, the law. Yes, he was. He was the father, movement. one of the fathers of. And I was I was sitting in his class as I was watching uh, bail reform unfold in New York and in New Haven, where they were using prediction models, mm -hmm. and was being very skeptical and was very, at the time very skeptical of those prediction models uh, uh, as they were being as they were being used. And then at some point, those two, you know, Jonathan and Shelley and Foucault, and my experience with torts and, and, and bail administration and bail reform in New York and New Haven just came together, and, this, uh, the, and that's how I conceived of, of the enterprise, and then we went back and forth a lot. Yeah, I think that's very, it makes a lot of sense, and it actually is very, it was very reassuring in a way because the influence from Foucault, um, the, the words come different from a different direction, words. different, no? different, yeah, different yeah, tradition, different, and they were empirical much research. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. much more empirical. And yeah. the, I mean, two things that are, I think, can round this out. Um, I remember Shelley and I had both been, you know, we were both very excited by the book Discipline and Punish, and we were very engaged in the conversation of, well, if, you know, this story about individual 
mechanisms of controlling and training the individual body of the fender you know, it's fascinating. It, it gives us a very different framework than thinking about the law or retribution, but it doesn't seem to fit a lot of the features of contemporary criminal justice. So is Foucault just missing that? There was a very interesting debate among criminologists like Stan Cohen, like um, Anthony Bottoms, like Clifford Cheering, broadly around the question of, well, what did Foucault really mean by discipline? And were there forms of discipline that were much more collective, etc.? And they kept kind of going around on this. There were several papers, and in a sense, I had a great advantage, which was I had, the, I had the opportunity to talk to Foucault while he was here, which was just mm -hmm. a couple of years sort of before that. And as you'll see, if you look at that now published conversation with Foucault, one of the things he was moving to in his own work or had moved to was the idea that sort of individualized concerns about dangerousness were very much being displaced by a concern with risk and things like social yeah. security, insurance, his student uh, Francois Evald had written a book in French called L'État Providence, or the Providence. insurance state, about the sort of rise of sort of social insurance as a mechanism of, of, of governance. So, in a sense, between Malcolm's empirical work and theorization of, of what was going on in New Haven and similar places, and our Shelley and my, myself being able to digest Foucault's direct intervention, we were able to kind of leapfrog the debate with the, in, the, in the criminological circle about whether this was discipline or not discipline, and sort of give it at least a clearer framing. They had been discussing sort of whether there were different kinds of discipline. Uh, <coughs> Shearing and Standing had written that piece about Disney World, which yeah. seemed to point to a very different yeah. kind of control mechanism, but they said, well, it's kind of like discipline, it, similar sur surveillance, etc. So it was a neat example of yeah. fortuity, you might there's say. Still, there's still <laughs> another element as you're talking that's coming back to me. Uh, for part of the time I was working on this, I was, uh, I was visiting at Hebrew University in Jerusalem and sitting in Stan Cohen's office. Stan was away in sabbatical and I was in his office and was, and was of course doing whatever I do when I sit in somebody else's office. I, I, I uh, snoop around at the books and the uh, papers that are sitting on their table. So I came across Nick Rose and uh, Ian Hacking and a lot of work that I wasn't really familiar with uh, and, and, some, and read more of Stan's own work which is in this vein. So, so the fact that I had been, uh, that it was just fortuitous that I was, that Stan had let me use his office when he was out of the country when I was there and I read some of the stuff that was sitting around in his shelves. So lots of different things came together. Good, good. And uh, in, in 1992, um, mm, did you imagine the, the later impact of the new pornology of actorial justice in the academic field? Um, no, I mean this was this was. Did, did we? Yeah, imagine yeah, the sense of. Yeah, was just an article. Had, or had, it had, will had, change. Had had no. Had in no some idea. way, I, I'm still amazed. I'm still amazed. <laughs> I, I had no idea. I thought it was a. I thought it was a really neat idea, and I knew that actuarial thinking had dramatically changed the way tort law is thought of, at least in the at least in academic life, and. Uh, and so, you know, and I and I thought it had some relevance here. And so Jonathan and I, you know, after all, we just started saying people are bilingual; they're using two different languages. Mm -hmm. and, 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 but and it, it was kind of accidental that it was that it got into criminology. Was it? You knew was it Tittle that? No, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. Uh, John was very busy clerking. I was. I was halfway around the world again, and 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 Chuck Tittle wrote me and said. I'm glad we published this. I never want to work with you ever again in my life. You were a pain in the ass because <laughs> Jonathan couldn't give me the time of day to correct spelling, and I was I was not very good at that anyway. Besides, you know, we were we were sending faxes back and forth okay, between the yeah. day of email, and 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 Tittle ended up doing. He liked it, but he ended up doing a lot of the editing. If, so if it looks like it's a really nicely written uh, article, uh, uh, Chuck Tittle, uh, uh, Charles Tittle owes, uh, you know, we owe some considerable debt to him. Because you use new penology, except in 1994 when you use title not yeah. Yeah. actuarial yeah. justice. Yeah. But then again, you return to the well, we bounced we the bounced. concept of the new penology. Yeah. You use it like synonyms. Synonymous yeah, yes, or, uh, or not necessary? No, no, synonymously. I think the, the, the actuarial justice is a more is a, 
is uh, I mean look we knew that we knew the first one was important and so we gave it we, that's why we gave it a title that said it's new and different and important mm -hmm. that's what the that's what the title new penology was trying to convey but in actuarial justice I wanted to I wanted to uh, I was invited to give the the Drapkin lecture again at Hebrew University uh, when I when I uh, was back in, and I wanted to give a I wanted to give a title that was more descriptive of what the enterprise was about, and so I, that's why I didn't want to, I didn't want to say variations on or new new. Mm -hmm. not, I want to say act. And then of course they gave me hell, uh, and finally I remember saying, "Well, what is actuarial justice in Hebrew? Maybe we'll just use the Hebrew term." And and they said actuarial. <laughs> so they, they just have adopted the French word. So so I, I stuck with it. I, I I remember having to fight because they they thought that was too esoteric for their, but it turned out that that's. That was a big. That was a big thing there as well. So. Well, clearly it was a. I think a much better title than I mean, the new penology. We're lucky that that didn't destroy it right there because it's such a generic term. Yeah. Plus, it had a distinct meaning in among students of correctional history because it was sort of like the gilded era yeah. time when yeah. people rediscovered rehabilitation and tried yeah. to. So it was kind of an awkward term. Actual justice was better because it named something that seemed important about the kind of epistemic. Now, now in, all, in all fairness, it's a term that John had used uh, four or five years before in, a, in an article he had written. That's so, true. Yeah. So it was so part so of the drew on title, it. no? Yeah. I tried it, but in a, in a broad sense, not in the penal yeah. Uh, yeah. reform or criminal change but, uh, but really, sense, really, no? Really the idea of actuarial, much more yeah. general. But I think had it not come out in criminology, it probably wouldn't have had as much impact. Criminology does have a huge readership. Lots of the people who reacted to it got, you know, cited it and replicated various versions of what they thought it was in ways that I thought were way off base, yeah. including people who were empirically testing. Yeah. They thought it was yeah, like yeah. a new form of, you know, but therapy that we were offering. But but and it, sho it shows you how <laughs> desperate and so much criminologists are yeah, for yeah. ideas that they can well, field it, it test. Sho it shows you how, <laughs> how, how, how right the awkward current uh, literary theorists are that say that the the, uh, the 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 book doesn't belong to the author it belongs to the reader <laughs> because boy people that the people that use that or responded yeah. to it, it it was hard to recognize what some people said but i remember going to the uh, criminology meetings the american society of criminology in 1994 because it was in miami and jerry skolnick was before the second before before the second before article. the second piece came out but well after the criminology piece mm -hmm. came out and i'd never been to a criminology meeting and i had uh, I was new in Miami, but it was amazing to me because I, I felt in a very immodest way a little bit like Harry Potter at the beginning of the <laughs> book. Like all these people knew me and I had yeah. no idea where they knew me from and it was yeah. from this article. From they had read the article and they're people from England and, and others. So There's it was one thing, I'm, you know, it, yeah, we, I still have notes over at my desk there for sort of uh, sketches on what a book would have looked like. And, and, and part of me I shares w with John, I wish we had written that book. On the other hand, uh, this little gem of an article, I think, and or two articles, has really, ha, you know, has, has has done more than I think. Of. But the w I do have one. I do have one. This one. Remember, the book came out in England, yeah. And so and so that got our ideas across in in on, on, in Europe in a way yeah. that. And that was a great book. If you go back and look yeah, at Nelkin, it's, it's Nelkin edited Nelkin. book, features yeah, yeah. of criminology. It's got yeah. tons of great people. Yeah. It's rare that you get into an yeah. edited volume. No, it's really it's, it's one of one of the really David good edited volumes. Around, yeah. But the, the one thing we never did, and I, I wish I wish we had that. I wish we had had explored it, uh, other facets of it, and published a piece in the Low Review, because uh, because uh, it would you know it would have been. Um, it's fine, finally, finally caught on. Uh, actuarial justice ideas have finally made it big in in law review, and they would, and they would, and I think the issue, in, in, really important, would have would have been would have been discovered and elaborated uh, ten years earlier had we had we had we published followed up mm -hmm. with the public as we had talked about a little bit. But had you thought in an entire complete book about new penology? That's what he was just saying. We, we, we outlined it in several conversations at various times and just uh, we were always doing other things. We moved off. And, and so Malcolm, I think you're a little bit like Foucault, you tend to work on multiple projects over a series I of work, years. I work and then you generate yeah. papers out yeah, of them yeah, yeah, as yeah. time goes by. No, my, look, it, it, has been, it, it has been a very important idea as I've gone on and done quite different things, but it still resonates and, and affects the way. Mm -hmm. So I'm, you know, it would have been nice to do it, and uh, 
uh, but the, the the paper met with maybe such, steel the, steel is? no the paper met with such such good good reaction that yeah. uh, that uh, that uh, there's something nice about having a small gym and not uh, not worrying <laughs> about a bigger brooch or something. You know that probably uh, beyond your intentions, actualism, uh, the new pathology was in touch with the general narratives of, of uh, criminal change of the 90s. Uh, it, it, and it was probably read like one of the first explanation of explanations of an epochal change in penology after rehabilitation. Uh, and even authors like Yokyan, for example, and others went beyond the criminal justice and wrote about a kind of actuarial culture, you know, uh, for example, people facing and handling, ri handling risk uh, in the shopping malls, in the malls. Uh, does this kind of description extends or contrarize your your ideas well I think like sort of as Malcolm was saying about the tort law I think both of us saw the new penology as actually something that was coming more from other fields into the criminal justice system mm -hmm. so I think it always yeah. made a great deal of sense to to think about now whether you wanted to go as far as some theorists like Ulrich Back and talk about a risk society or Anthony Giddens who thought mm -hmm. that we were essentially in a post-industrial form of risk uh, which I think there were a lot to say about, but I think then you're really deciding to, to make a sociological theory uh, of, of, of a broader change, yeah. and I think we were making enough sweeping general. Well, we went, we went, I mean, look, one way of looking at it is all we did, we'd had enough varied experience to realize that the individual was being displaced in all areas of law. Uh, the two we talk about in the two papers and footnotes of nowhere is tort law mm -hmm. and in and in and in uh, uh, discrimination law, racial discrimination law, where where the where there's the big battle between the intent tests and the effects tests. And at that time, the effects tests were bigger than they are today. Mm -hmm. But we, in both cases, they were saying they're looking at they're looking at aggregates and trying to figure out patterns. And you see, and of course, all of public policy is like. Every you know where you build hospitals and build roads and build this and that. so so one crime is the rare exception that is has a radical focus on individuals and all we were saying is that's under attack and we see it being we see it being a, being a, 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 a moving along like other areas of law and other areas of public policy. In fact, I think one way to see Vincent Chow, our friend Vincent yeah. Chow's work, is he's kind of now theorizing this normatively by saying. Yeah. Of course, the criminal law shouldn't be yeah. treated as this retributive thing yeah. about individuals. Yeah. It's administrative yeah. law. It's about how to optimize yeah. the well-being yeah. of society. No, no, so, a, you know, and he's giving it a forceful normative yeah. uh, yeah. character. Okay. So, we, so in a sense, we were we were saying the criminal law is catching up with every other area of law that we, or lots of other areas of law, displacing the individual as a unit of analysis. Okay. Besides the USA, the other case that you examine directly is Israel. 1994. And certain features of new penology have been identified by other authors in countries beyond the global north, for example Australia or even Latin America. Originally, did you believe or do you believe now at the present that the emergence of an actuarial justice could be extended to other developed countries and cultures or the other uh, on the other hand, can we think in managerialism without no actuarialism? Well, on the, uh, well, clearly it's a global phenomena um, that we're seeing here. It's interesting, um, I, mean, I think Israel is an interesting case study. The, the little discussion of, of Gaza in, in, uh, in the actual justice piece is probably a little farther to the left than Malcolm is today on, on on that particular no, uh, I, no, I'm still no. I, I, I gave that I gave that as the Drapkin lecture at Hebrew <laughs> University. So I wanted to, I wanted to, I, I wanted to, I wanted to dramatize. I said, look, if 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 you're if you're engaged in an occupation, a benign occupation even, uh, yeah, but it's still a war. So you so you know you're still there's st so you don't you don't you don't you don't manage even a quiet war 
through due process. You have to manage danger. It's always saying you understand that about about uh, about uh, about the settlements, about the territories in Israel. But this is the way the police are doing in New York City or in Chicago in in, mm -hmm. in black neighborhoods. It's not all that different. Probably yeah. less benign in Chicago than it is there. In fact, so and they they so so it was a, it was a way of it was a way of trying to convey instantly because they all knew what I was talking about uh, the audience there about 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 the, the West Bank uh, but uh, then I say well that's the way police and, or law enforcement in a lot of areas manages and that's the new that's the new way as for whether you can have a managerialism without actualism I, mean, I think managerialism is a broader phenomena yeah. and one that yes you can certainly have um, I would say actuarialism is sort of a s part of the one of the tools that can function very successfully in a within a managerial regime. But the essence of managerialism, to me, is I guess it's a version of bureaucracy, but a, but uh, w ways of uh, essentially transforming the, the governance of a of an institution into a set of procedures or processes that can be kind of monitored and tracked, so that you can measure success by whether you're kind of getting reports filed or you know how many arrests are being cleared I think, I think but you could still have I think you might be able to have individuals as the focus of analysis okay see what see what struck what struck I think both John and I is this piece came out just at the, at, at the time that opponents or skeptics could say ha ha it doesn't work because it was the, the, the huge run-up in crime, or uh, not in crime, but in incarceration, was driven largely by retributivist appeals, by, by, you know, just lock them up because they did something bad. Uh, the, the original people that started thinking about incapac selective incapacitation, which, which was what we did. Greenwood, for example. What? Greenwood. Green were, were arguing that we could reduce prison populations. Oh, yeah. And not I think that's a very important point. And in fact, well, I, w I would say, you know, I even then thought that the retributive language of the punitive turn was largely masking a, a commitment to general incapacitation, right? And w which did suggest a kind of risk mentality. But you're quite right. I think if there's a, one of the biggest mistakes I would say we made was to uh, take the selective incapacitation scheme of the Rand Corporation as sort of a, a clear signal as to the way things were going, when in fact mm -hmm. we should have seen that it was obliterated, right? I mean, that... that three strikes. Some people thought, oh, well, we got three strikes instead of selective incapacitation. But look what it was. It was a completely unactuarial system that simply gave prosecutors the power to decide who's dangerous, you know, on, without any evidence or systematic. Uh, in, in that sense, in, in 1994, you suggest that actuarial justice was a nebulous concept, you know, which lack of well-articulated ideology and identification technique. Um, the idea of the pre-political thought. Of, of the actuarial justice. Mm. In following articles, this reflection is absent. Uh, at least did not appear so clearly, mm. the idea of pre-political thought. Do both, both of you still think this is a pre-political thought? What do you mean by pre-political? In the sense of neutral. No, I, th I, th I, th I think I, I think I get you. That is, that is, we did think that this, and I do think it came out of. I, I, I'm not sure I'd use the term pre-political, but I would use the term technocratic. I think Pete Greenwood is a mm. good example. I think Susan Estrich and, and Mark Moore, uh, who, who yeah. developed their theory at Harvard, not particularly related with left or right, probably, it, it, no? it's politics. Well, it, it, it's, it's, it's probably, right. it's probably. You know, if you had to push, it would probably be to the right. But it, but it's, 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 it's a technocratic. It comes at it in an orthogonal manner rather than left and right. It comes, you know, it comes at some angle. I mean, I think it was truly as neutral as anything could be in this sense. So, you know, the and and there are different layers here that have to be acknowledged. The green, the uh, the uh, the Bloomstein contribution, which is really the massively influential <coughs> work he did on the president's. Mission report of 1967, which brings essentially an operations research vision to, to thinking about the interconnection of the criminal justice system. And it's not really actuarial in a direct sense, but it, 
in the sense of creating a much more of a truly machine integrated vision of the system and one where you could quantify the inputs and outputs at different levels and decide what you wanted to achieve was enormously in influential and yet it was I think Al personally and the administration he was part of were liberals who thought that th this would make local criminal justice more efficient ultimately allow better civil rights values to be enforced in these systems etc so I don't think they saw it as, as tending and if you think about well, we should have drawn more I think insight from the fact that for instance the right wing Supreme Court rejected actuarial reasoning in the McCleskey case right they famously said they didn't want to take yes. uh, from, from a race point of view they didn't want to look at you know uh, accepted for pretrial <laughs> release <laughs> decisions but not for yeah, not I for, think we even made too much of that when I went back and read actual yeah. justice again I saw how much we made and is it made a big impression on me of the, the two Supreme Court decisions yeah. that legitimized preventive detention and bail, which we saw from the perspective of our good friend and colleague in case of Malcolm, Caleb Foote, who had fought the good fight for a constitutional right to bail. So these cases looked really decisive as a turn away from an individual rights model and perhaps to, toward a concern with risk. But if you look at the system that the federal government constitutionalized, it wasn't actual at all. It was just judicial clinical judgment, more or less. And then you, 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 you well, they, 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 they modeled everything. The fact of the matter is not, none of the preventive detention statutes, uh, they were rarely used because it was just much easier to set really high money bail rather than go, to go through a preventive detention mm -hmm. uh, hearing. It, take, it, it takes 20 seconds to say a million dollar bail, and it takes two days to go to have a preventive detention hearing. So mm -hmm. a million dollar bail always always trumped. <laughs> and in terms of the politics today, the left is leading the charge to replace money bail with risk assessment. In fact, California courts just, or the California Attorney General just decided not to appeal a, uh, a case challenging a bail amount, which may lead to a legislative. Here, here's, where, here's where actuarial justice is returning now after being quiescent for 20 of these 25 years. And, and that, is, that is the new right-left coalition, the smart on crime, the right on crime, the MacArthur Foundation on the left, and the Arnold Foundation on the right, also the, Co the Koch brothers on the right, and, and you know, the good guys on the, on the are coming together. And everybody, can th everybody thinks that algorithms are the new silver bullet. Algorithms are simply new penology, actuarial justice, uh, 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 you know, re by another name, with a fancy term, and they're going to have all the same problems, all the same problems. Uh, or maybe worse problems, because the, the actuarial uh, model, at least, is more transparent. Yeah. It, it is more based on the social science model rather than the kind of proprietary. Well, well the, ac the actual, software. yeah, the problem <laughs> now, one of the differences is, with the algorithms, uh, at least one state Supreme Court has held that that uh, that the the company that 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 does this work for the 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 the, the, the court or the prosecution I forget uh, does not have to uh, release the inner workings of its model its proprietary trade secret information and my hunch is that that will continue to be upheld so we now have we now have uh, we, we we're now going to have really bad risk prediction models. I don't know what's better, good, worse, uh, uh, bad prediction <laughs> models or good prediction models. I mean, there's the machine. The promise of machine learning is something I personally don't feel like I can assess. But that's one of the claims that some of these will constantly be updating in a way that your typical actuarial model, like say the the main corrections one they use. But you uh, see it like the old. second moment of actualism. Oh, oh, it's oh, not yeah. oh, no, no, anything with, different. With a, it's with, the with second a, stage, with second moment. That, that's right. With a vengeance, with a vengeance, and and the difference here is you have the right and the left, both, you know, walking hand in hand, embracing the idea. Look, here's one of the problems with the old bail prediction models. And it will, they will even loom larger in, in the, and, and not only bail prediction, but it would be good for prediction models for, for parole, sentencing, parole, probation, the whole, the whole work we draw, really. And that is, the more, the more sophisticated the model, and maybe the more accurate the model is, the more bits of data you get. And the problem with the more bits of data you get, uh, if you're dealing with people that are charged with criminal offenses is 
that some it's going to be incomplete. You, you're not going to learn about about whether their parents graduated from high school or not, or whether they had whether they grew up in one family homes, or or whether they had whether they had. Uh, so 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 the more data you need, the more missing data you're going to have. And in the past, cases with missing data were treated as we can't make a recommendation. And the idea we can't make a recommendation, in fact, translated as a practical matter to judges as a recommendation of no. Hmm. So in New York City, I watched the better the prediction model they got, <laughs> the more people were held in pretrial oh, detention because the higher the higher the the higher that no recommendation was. <laughs> it, it, it's, just, it's happening all over again. Yeah. Well, well, one of the questions that we, we thought to for you was this uh, thing related to the uh, court decision. Yeah, because many members of the Supreme Court uh, changed since uh, 1970. So, what changes? Because one of your ideas, uh, I think it was in Australia, in Australia Justice, was this idea about one thing that could slow down the the path of Australian justice could be the functions of the court. Yeah. So in this regard, we, we wonder what judges do you think supported or slowed down the development of, of, of Australian justice and where if there were new leading cases mm -hmm. since two, uh, 2003 to that time, because 2003 is the, your final paper related. Yeah. Which paper was that? Uh, it's in the, um, is it the, the Cohen one in the piece? Messenger. Yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 right. yeah. Right. And that was actually an updating of the 1995. Uh, yeah, we're updating yeah. the 1995. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I, 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 I don't think the issues ever were squarely addressed by the court, and I can't imagine they would be for a long time. But I would say that I suspect if there was one judge that might, or one justice, Supreme Court justice, that might have been sympathetic if we were sitting down talking to him, uh, or be the most sympathetic, it would have been Ant Antonin Scalia. Scalia. Yeah, it would have been the super right-wing guy that is that believed in individual autonomy and responsibility in, in, with a vengeance. Well, uh, I could be wrong, but that, that, no. would, that, would, be the, that's, uh, that would be an ironic... Uh, and I would ironic agree twist. with Malcolm that the Supreme <laughs> Court has pretty assiduously avoided sort of ruling on things like profiles. So for in, the, in the one case where they considered a drug courier profile, they went out of their way. It was interesting because the defense there, since he made the actual justice argument, said this can't be reasonable suspicion because reasonable suspicion implies a story, yeah, an individualized yeah. narrative about what this guy's <laughs> doing. Instead, they're just running this machine that is telling them. The, and the court, instead of saying, well, yeah, uh, yes or no, the, the, the machine-like thinking is important, they just said, well, all we're going to consider is whether this information would support reasonable suspicion to yeah. a police officer, whether or not they relied on clinical or not. So they've always avoided it. Now, and that's what the Supre that's what the Wisconsin Supreme Court did with this proprietary interest. So the outcome is intuitively <laughs> understandable. So, but I suspect if we did get you know a, a square challenge based around a Virginia-like statute that say gave you a longer sentence in prison because you were a juvenile offender at 16 or something, mm -hmm. that you could get a. a, a a challenge, I, w I would think, under the current court, I, I would suspect you could get four votes to say that there's a dignity Eighth Amendment problem with a direct use of actual justice like that. I think Sotomayor, Kagan, and Ginsburg, uh, and possibly Kennedy, but I bet Breyer would defect to the other side and you'd probably end up yeah. with a 5-4. Because <laughs> Breyer was very technocratic and a big supporter of the sentencing I, guidelines. I, I talked to, I talk to, I talk to, uh, to some law professors and judges in both Germany and Finland, and the hyper super Kantian Germans. German judges and German influence <laughs> judges loved it, but their concern was a different concern. They didn't come after this. They didn't, they didn't like uh, certain types of strict liability rules in and for instance, they wanted to get rid of the blood alcohol level test for drunk driving. 
saying, and, and they would, they, a lot of them had a lot of data saying, you know, there are a lot of people that drink and don't have accidents, and it's not clear that the difference between the people that drink, and the, you know, so, uh, you know, up to a level. Right. And, but the, and they, and they hated so helmet students. laws, you know, the, 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 yeah. uh, the motor, so they, they hated all sorts of laws that, that would be defended, that and I would defend, not necessarily in criminal law, but in public policy, <laughs> you know, on, on the basis of, you know, actuarial I'm judgments about that it's going to reduce, it's going to reduce the incidence of accidents and the seriousness of accidents. So, of course, we should, we should have uh, drunk driving laws and we should have a helmet law. But they didn't, that just violated the notion of the autonomy of the individual in making judgments about the, you know, imposing aggregate judgments on individuals. And so, now, one, 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 one judge later was, uh, what later was appointed to the German Constitutional Court, and uh, I, and so far as I know, he never he never advanced his argument in any serious way uh, in his position there. Okay, uh, now <laughs> we would like to move forward to uh, what after uh, those papers you you wrote. Um, when you wrote these two papers, was that in the early nineties? Since that moment, other influence papers and books also written by other scholars on penal change were published especially at the end of the, of the 90s and the beginning of the 21st century which ones of these papers of these works the impact most in your framework and the, in which way uh, we could see I think we actually did write a book. It was called The Culture of Control. It's just that David Garland put his name on it. But the, the <laughs> core <laughs> argument in that book, in many ways, is, yeah, is yeah, that yeah. The, the system has become yeah. obsessively focused with risk. And he had already written a paper saying that it wasn't new at all in 1995 or so. So he completely yeah. had switched his mind by the, the culture of control. And, um, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, no, I think the culture of control, I think we probably did have some influence on him. Um, uh, he spent a l he spent a lot of time here, on, um, but uh, I haven't really followed a lot of this. I mean, I've talked to people, and what I what I do see is uh, I meet people, and when Jonathan and I edited Punishment Society, we had people writing say, "Ah, it doesn't work because see," and 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 of course they were good to point that out. Although I think what they did was use us as a straw man to create their analysis. I mean. To, to go on. That is, you know, that is what we see is corrections departments haven't gotten rid of all their social workers. Probation probation officers still have a social welfare mentality. They haven't been turned into technocrats, and and we were we were happy to see that. And I don't think any of that really, uh, really uh, contradicted what we said. We were saying there's a new trend. Again, we the term we used when we were talking to these people is is you're all you're all bilingual and you speak two languages and you, you think in two different ways and you go back and forth and you're not even aware of it when you do that and I think that's probably the case today uh, uh, maybe actuarial or now algorithm uh, uh, language is a bit more salient than but uh, but it's 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 just a new way of thinking, and there are two things that are code. Just like look in 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 in, in employment discrimination in discrimination law, there are two tests, and they're at constant war with each other. One is the intent test, where you have to if to prove discrimination, you have to prove that that guy you didn't like her or him. Mm -hmm. And then there's the and then there's the there's a t statistical test. There's no chance by random selection that these many people would have been excluded from yeah. from a job. And so and so we those two things live simultaneously in one area. Uh, fault still has some plays some marginal role in in in. Uh, in torts, uh, I just had a fender bender the other day, so I'm sensitive <laughs> to this, and uh, and uh, and so and in the same way in the crime. So there too, yeah. but at least what we did, I think our contribution, we were saying there's a way of thinking, and there's a way there there's an institution there, the development of institutions, institutions. that have reoriented the way people organize yeah. their thinking about it, and that's that's. You know, it was a modest contribution to call attention to a modest but nevertheless significant development. I think there's also been some, you know, impressive work that ha you know certainly has influenced my thinking on this. Just to mention a few, 
uh, Lu Lucia Zedner and, and Andrew Ashworth have done a lot of work on sort of preventive uh, criminal law and sort of the preventive I, I, term. I, I, on Lucia, I think we really influenced yeah. her heavily. And, but she's really taken really the work in yeah. interest. Yeah. Kelly Hannah Maffet yeah. at yeah. Toronto, yeah. I think, yeah. very interesting, yeah. important yeah. work. Pat O'Malley, who was kind of theorizing yeah. these things at the same time, but his work on uncertainty yeah. kind yeah. of brought yeah. out yeah. a different, true. less actual dimension to That's risk. Right. And then I have to say, we're both... And I think, I think Nikki, we both like Nikki uh, Lacey's work. Well, Nikki Lacey's yeah, work. Nikki and, Lacey. you know, the person who wrote the book that closest to the book probably that people imagine we would have written was is Bernard Harcourt. And I think there's a lot that's good in that book. There's some things that are less good. He has some kind of interesting but very Chicago school. He was at Chicago at the time. Arguments about... Or provocative arguments. Provocative like arguments about how, yeah, no? prediction makes it uh, too easy for white people to commit crime because they're not being... Free. But at the core of it, his claim that yeah. what we really need to do is not just reject risk, but actually insist on sort of methods of randomizing the, the behavior of the carceral state. had a great insight to it, and uh, yeah. I've kind of come back to those arguments yeah. in thinking about how we can perhaps try to break out. Because actuarialism, the one thing we could be taking to task for is that, uh, uh, and generally, uh, governing through crime and other features of the current era, certainly didn't invent the racialization of criminal justice. Uh, actuarialism was only made it worse, but it didn't, it didn't start there. And so taking measures to really try to uproot that is, I think, an imperative. The 9-11, no? Yeah. No? Uh, yeah, well, uh, one of the major shift probably the, the last time was the tower, Twin Towers in New York, the 9-11 uh, in 2001. You, you wrote uh, this, you amplify your, your arguments in 2003, 20, 1995. Uh, you can have some ideas al about what could be a real justice between the af in the aftermath mm. of 9 11. I don't well, remember what we said. Well, I, look, <laughs> I, I remember I, I presented a dissertation, a master dissertation, dissertation in September 2001, mm. um, and everybody think that well, the future is in good. USA will be actualism. After the 9 11, yeah. actuarialism yeah, well, will look, spread it, in all the criminal mm. field. Look, it, I don't know if it spread in all the criminal fields. Probably in some it hasn't, but I'll tell you, it, uh, 9 11 was a, gave a great boost to, uh, uh, to profiling and, and, use it, and now uh, and using machine learning to, to, to profile. So I think, I think, I think 9 11 clearly gave the big boost to profiling, and profiling is a is a form of actual real justice when they, when they use it. So, so I, so I think, yeah, I think, I think. I think that's right, but I would say, you know, it's social, the social media revolution, which really happened yeah. after 9 11 in many yeah. ways, yeah. has, has yeah. maybe been an even more influential because, you know, if you're going to try to use that kind of material to begin to make predictive judgments, you've really got to go actuarial or, or yeah. machine yeah. learning. Yeah. It just, you know, police now are spending a huge amount of time using social media, social media. data. Uh, or just imagine, just imagine the, you know, the, 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 an, the analysts that are going through the billions of uh, uh, phone calls to try to, to find, to detect patterns and so on, to, to narrow the focus. And yeah, so it's a, yeah, I think, I think it, is, uh, it is here to stay. I mean, we, did, we have to figure out how to, how to, how to deal with it. It's a and it strikes me that here we are 17 years or 18 years and for instance, we're still going through, you know, a TSA line that, in some ways, is there's nothing impressively profiling about it. <laughs> They're basically just searching everyone's bags to make sure we don't have water. And you know, in other words, it's still a very brute force. Sort of, you know, my impression from my brief times in Israel is that the the security or Ben Gurion is much more profiled. They 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 know they they use much more sophisticated technology to identify anybody that they're more interested in, in learning more about. I think the U.S. is not at the head of the class, at least what we're seeing there. Maybe at the NSA level, we're, uh, we're, we're the best in the world, I suppose, but um, yeah, I, I'm sometimes surprised how relatively unsophisticated the, the post-9-11 terrorism world we live in is. We're still relying on poorly paid employees to try to, you know, find I think I think I think that's I think that's entirely public relay almost entirely public relations to give the public a feel that uh, they're safe. The TSA, it's the, all the performance. The, yeah, performance the, art. No, the the, the <laughs> airport, the airport, uh, the airport security checks. I think I think that's, I think that, that largely has to do with uh, with uh, trying to calm a, a, 
uh, an anxious flying public, <laughs> but uh, even as they complain about it. <laughs> but, uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, well, I think Jonathan has mentioned before uh, the name of Anthony Bottoms, mm. yeah, who coined mm -hmm. the one of strong concept in criminology, like criminology of penal punitive or penal populism or punitive populism yeah, of yeah. back there in 1995. On the other hand, the attention to the institutionalization, institution, institutionalization <laughs> gotcha. sorry, yeah, of hard. the victims' rights movement. You could say it in Spanish, I would know it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> institutionalization. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Too many T's. <laughs> was after by uh, your papers. In the forms and limits of the new penology in 2003, you have noticed that there is a big gap between the public and the experts, that but an, no a contradiction and even a, a mutual relationship between new penology and penal populism. Uh, we wonder if you could yeah. explain yeah. a little bit about I, I, this. Plus more, yeah. Yeah, I hear. I, I mean, Jonathan and I may differ on this, and I'm and I and I don't. I'll say this. Um, I think I believe it, but it but it's, it's, it's a hypothesis at least. Um, The, the, the rise of the victims' rights movement and penal populism at its, at, at its most uh, vigor uh, was, uh, strikes me, a return to rather primitive uh, vengeance that was not particularly, it wasn't, it wasn't diametrically opposed, but it wasn't compatible, so compatible with the new penology. Now that we see a decline I mean, the victims' rights groups are there, and they're now have they're now stakeholders, and they have a seat at the table. But they're not they're not now as vindictive as they were 25 years ago, 20 years ago. And it's not surprise. It's not a coincidence to me that as their voice has so decreased, down, so down. Uh, that 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 the technocratic voices of algorithms and so on have increased. The technocrats are back after being on the sidelines for 20 years. I, I, I really think that and I, I uh, you know, as much as I feared the, the vindictive uh, uh, victims' rights people, I really fear the new technocrats uh, and the algorithms and uh, we may see actuarial justice with a, with, a, with a vengeance now embraced by everybody. We, we tend to be. It's, a, this is, it's the latest silver bullet. You can get the right wing and the left wing both celebrating it as a, as a great, uh, great new development that's going to solve all our problems. I don't quite remember now whether we took the term from Tony or I thought we had a slightly different term. One, did he talk about authoritarian there was populism? So, so or we reference it with Tony yeah. by, yeah. by no. reading the article. Yeah, yeah no, they're uh, very the similar was, ideas. Uh, I mean, yeah, I think yeah. from, yes. Bottom in 1995, 1995 present the managerialism yeah. right. as one kind of yeah, yeah. brand of the new right. Right. configuration of the well, I field look, and I then the penal populism I think there were a lot and then of people. it just started yeah. no with, with other yeah. authors think, I think there were a, a lot of people David Garland I think Lucy Zedner there were a lot of people that were saying something is going on here mm -hmm. and they were looking at the end uh, the the elephant as it were <laughs> and and trying to, you know it was new and different but it was in the room and yeah. bothering it. but they said we were seeing different parts of it and mm -hmm. and uh, so Nobody. I guess maybe David Garland's come the closest to put to, to synthesize yeah. all the all the components. And I do of think that, that Malcolm's right to focus on the victims' rights movement. It's kind of what certainly drew my attention to this. Well, I if we were focusing on the new penology as a trend that was operating among technocrats and insiders in the system, it certainly couldn't account for many things that were going on. For instance, some of which looked very risk-like, say for the creation of sexually vi violent predator programs in some 17 states that still have hundreds of people who will be locked up forever, not based on any scientific idea of risk, but based largely on a popular monster sort of uh, image of uh, of this. Or take something that one of the papers, the only paper I've ever written my, with my wife, but Frank Zimmering I think uh, accurately says it may be the best thing I've ever written, uh, was a study of the new aggravating factors that, that states had adopted since the Supreme Court had basically taken its hands off of regulating the death penalty provisions in state statutes. And what you could see is that, you know, the first decade of aggravating factors 
after the death penalty came back were right out of the model penal code. They were all very uh, legal and jurisprudential and kind of high-minded and public policy-like. By the time you got to the late 90s, it was stuff like satanic rituals. Death during a satanic ritual got you a death penalty. Uh, killing a very old person or a disabled person, it was very much a kind of victim of the weak approach. Uh, and so we were trying to get at that. And we're, we were acknowledging that the development of the penal system in the 90s certainly was not following the track we thought it was going to in the new penal system. Uh, one of the you oh, incidentally, okay. incident, during the 90s, it's interesting, uh, um, the president nominated Al Blumstein to be the director of the National Institute of Justice, and the, the Senate turned him down. Is that right? Yeah. Clinton appointed him and the Senate I, turned I, I, him down? I, I, On I, the grounds yeah. that he was too left-wing? Yeah, he was too left-wing. Oh my God. And this was at the height of the victims' rights movement, and mm -hmm. here was... A, te a technocrat <laughs> that was that wanted mm -hmm. to, that wanted to mm -hmm. reduce crime, and all that, but didn't speak the language of didn't speak right. the language of the victims' rights, and so they they uh, they did the same with Norval Morris. Uh, so two of the America's leading criminal justice experts were rejected by by the country. I, I I think in both cases they ended up uh, not being rejected. So, that, but they saw the handwriting on the wall and and just had their names uh, asked to have their names mm -hmm. withdrawn. Uh, so. And for a lot of us who were <laughs> watching politics, it probably the year that epitomized this was the Bush Dukakis election in '88, when yeah. in a famous exchange, yeah. Dukakis was, that was asked what he would do if his wife was no? raped, yeah. and instead of getting angry and talking about how upsetting it was for him to think about his wife as a victim, he said, well, as you know, I don't believe the death penalty deters, and went on to a very Harvard Kennedy School sort of answer, <laughs> <laughs> and lost the election, you know, <laughs> I think. Yeah, because right. even Obama <laughs> never mentioned the death penalty no. in campaign. And he was for it. He criticized the Supreme Court for striking down Louisiana's death penalty for yeah. child rapist law. Well, uh, <laughs> Clinton, Clinton, Clinton. But next year. I was on death row at one day, uh, one day in in, 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 in in Arkansas, and ended up talking to an inmate that was to be executed the next day. Well, he tried to blow his brain out, and I was with the, I was with a group of people. Wrecked. I was with a group of people, and he recognized only one. He even wanted to talk. Who did the guy recognize? He was the attorney general, but at the time he had been the prosecutor that successfully prosecuted. Him. But he recognized he the face, and so. He went, the next day, literally the next day, uh, Bill Clinton was there standing, uh, uh, watching through the glass window, uh, the, this guy being executed. I wasn't there on that day, I was there the day before. But, uh, and he but went on said, to win the, or yeah, do very well yeah, in the New Hampshire primary. He went, he, went on to, he went on to do very well. But he, <laughs> and of course he, he uh, uh, probably the single, the single toughest criminal law ever passed by the, by the feds was uh, the one that he signed into law that day, the the blocking the dates. So the, 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 the Republic, after the Dukakis uh, fiasco, the, the Democrats learned to be better Republicans than the Republicans in terms of being tough on crime. And so thank goodness so. now, for various reasons, uh, that those aren't salient, there's not a salient. Uh, Trump is trying to make them salient, but they, they, have, they, they have no purchase, there are very little purchase. In, across the country these days. We're lucky. Um, one of the limits of New Penology, you have said that uh, one of the limits or failures of New, no, of New Penology was that it denies the very specialness of, of crime. So opposite to the old Penology, New Penology has not provided yet a truth of crime, a story of crime. Do you imagine that New Penology could find some way to fix this issue. That's your terminology. Yes. Yeah. Maybe like, like <laughs> the, the old penology, you know, that, that, that a truth was achieved to mm. obtain the truth of crime, mm. an explanation yeah. of the criminal the, the, the representation of the... There was this gap between the yeah. public discourse and yeah. the... Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, it's a good question. I, 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 I'm not sure that, uh, for some of the reasons Malcolm's been alluding to, I'm not sure it's going to need a, a, to, to to come up with the truth of crime, because in some ways, um, if we are moving back in a direction when people are going to be less invested in crime as a sort of you know, test case of this 
decency of society and the political system, etc., and where it's going to be more handled as a, a technocratic issue. And I, I, it'll never completely be technocratic. It may be possible for what we're hearing now under phrases like evidence-based public policy, right, mm -hmm. to, to create a story that's basically based on the old expert model with maybe less pretense and more, uh, somewhat more humble presentation. But it seems to me that there's uh, a, another possibility, which is that, um, yeah, that we remain romantics when it comes to crime, that our, our ideas of crime in some ways are, you know, very influenced by the 19th century invention of the novel and the idea of getting into people's heads. It's interesting to me that in California now, from what I've learned, the lifers getting out on parole, even though they now have a very elaborate actuarial system that, that rates every prisoner in the, in, in the system as to their risk of recidivism, they rely more on whether or not the person is able to communicate a sense of remorse and insight about whether they, you know, why they committed the crime. Now, they want a truth. They want to know that there's a truth to this crime that you've, that you've figured out. Now, maybe that'll pass and eventually it'll just be the numbers that, like, that will drive it again, but uh, I think that is a, it's, you know, it's it's a reality that, that crime is as much influenced by popular culture and by the kind of popular imagination as it is by the desire of criminologists and sort of technocrats to, to make it their own. Okay, perfect. Uh, just, we are finished. Uh, you both published... Because uh, I'll need a beer very soon. Yeah, yeah. we will. <laughs> John and I know it's not last five yet. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Well, the, the last time you, you published together about Antares was this uh, paper in 2003, 2003. So we wonder what ideas of 1992 and 1994, the first uh, paper, the, the founders of New Penology, would you firmly rescue today? Uh, which ideas would you diverge from there to now? I wouldn't give up any of the single I, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, I thought, I thought, right I, there. I, I thought, what, I thought, I thought the strength and perhaps the appeal of that, of those two papers is that they, for some reason, they, they came in at exactly the right level of generality that connect, that allowed people to connect their own thinking in a variety yeah. of ways. So in that sense, you know, it seems to me that we've done something and it's been useful mm -hmm. and we should be proud and happy that we did something that was useful. So I'm not sure I would want to go back and tinker with it. I'm not sure I'd like to, I'd like to, I'd, I'd like to update it. Although I'm really, really delighted that uh, you guys noticed it was the 25th anniversary and, <laughs> and wanted us to talk about it. Because, I mean, it, ha it has had a life of its own. And I think it's because we, we tapped into something that was going around. I mean, Garland's work came out, and Nikki Lacey and, and Lucy Zedner and Ashworth, a lot of people were trying to make sense of stuff. And we provided one window onto, onto, that, onto, the, you know, onto that fermenting chain that, uh, that, uh, that has resonated with a lot of people. And so that's, that's, that's pretty good. <laughs> when I read some of the tendency in which I'm not unsympathetic to in, in among our younger peers today, like uh, Michelle Phelps and Josh Page and Phil Goodman, for instance, with their call for a more agonistic look at change in criminal justice, which I don't disagree with, but I always worry a little bit about the famous Borges short story about the, the picture of the world that, or the map of the world that became as complex uh, as the world itself and yeah, therefore it was yeah. impossible to use. And I think one of the great virtues of that paper was it basically said, yeah. look, here are three kinds of trains that we see going on. Change in the way people are yeah. sort of uh, attempting to objectify, you know, criminality as it were, changes in the targets of it, changes in the, help me, the purposes or justifications the uh, yeah. of it. So we had three, and it, it, I think it's a great model in a way for doing middle range theorizing, yeah. right? We're not saying like, here's a deep structure that explains yeah. you know, everything about yeah. the development yeah. of this. It's, yeah. here's some nor features. Are we, nor are we saying, I mean, that, uh, people would say, well, the old and the new, it's, you know, the old is out and the new is in. And it's, it's a really it's really old wine and new new bottles. I think it was yeah. Dave, David Garland. But I don't think we were saying that. We were saying we're seeing we seeing a a, 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 a market a market <laughs> shift, and we're trying to capture the outlines of it. And uh, and enough people have found it useful to describe things that I never would have imagined. Because uh, I mean, my interest in this, I mean, my experience in, in all this came out of my thinking really intensely and watching really practical. Uh, is you, on bail, and then I read Pete Greenberg's uh, w 
Creek uh, P, uh, Green, Greenwood. Greenwood's work mm -hmm. on, uh, on 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 incapacitation, and and that that those were two concrete instances, and then and then I saw it a little bit everywhere. So we were, we wrote it up, and people have seen it in all sorts of places. They probably misused it. And, I mean, clearly they have often, but on the other hand, it's clear that it's been a a lens or a frame of reference that's helped people make sense of of a variety of phenomena all over the place. So, so uh, and uh, since since change in law moves at glacial paces before global warming, um, uh, it's you know it, this this ought to have some some uh, some use for another twenty five or fifty years. Who knows? Well, especially as the for because of this broader crisis of the carceral state that is bringing back the need for technocracy to kind of legitimize and also lower costs, etc. I think we're going to see more attempt to actuarialize the justice system and therefore more need for a, a both a normative and a deeper critical sociological here's, look. Here's what, here's what bothers me. I mean, uh, the one thing I wish we could have done, I do wish we had published something in the law review. Because law professors read only law reviews and they don't read other things. And so while we've been cited a lot, including law reviews some, most of the citations have been in criminology and social, and social science journals. And now you read you read law reviews, and and they're talking about algorithms like they're it's it's to me it's like rediscovering the wheel. John, Jonathan, <laughs> John, and they're saying, oh, this is new and it's terrible. And, and Jonathan and I laid this out 25 well, years ago uh, in more them. detail than in fact most of the current things. And it would have been nice for those people to realize that there had been something of a history well, and, they would learn and work through it. They would have learned something. Gain some and and that they would have gained some analytic distance and, they would, and, and the pieces that they're now writing would be a lot more sophisticated. Well, it's probably an artifact of the fact that uh, student-edited law reviews, it's now practically required for the author to say somewhere in the first paragraph, this is the first paper to have ever uh -huh. said X about Y, uh -huh. which it, as an old-school scholar to me is just ass backwards. Uh -huh. Like you're not trying to say new things, oh, I you just, do. I just, I just, I, I just read, I just read, I just read a, I just read an essay submitted to the Yale Law Journal that the editors asked me to look at, and this guy said this is the first and only, and I wrote back, it's very dangerous, and I gave him an example that just. <laughs> Thank you. You allow me to clarify everything later by yeah, editing. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah, good, good. good see, we have one question. If you yeah. Time. Yeah. 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 It, it, it says that the, the, the post punitive term. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, it says that they use criminal justice system systems to witness a sort of post punitive term in which penal moderation appears to be gaining traction across the political and social landscape. If this is correct, uh, what is the role that electoral justice may play in this new penal climate? Uh, 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 it's interesting, we just talked about that at lunch today. Uh, <laughs> I, th I think the big, new, important development that, uh, that we're just beginning to, to see the first days of is, elect uh, is electronic monitoring and I think I think that uh, I think the use of electronic monitoring will be shaped in some considerable part by actuarial judgments about uh, levels of risk, uh, and uh, particularly when you're trying to distinguish between uh, straight probation, probation with electronic mon and, and incarceration. Which is what makes it so important, I think, for some of us to get active in the law reviews and elsewhere to to be much more critical about this about this turn. Because my real fear is that. What we are seeing is kind of what we kind of predicted would happen in the 90s, yeah, that is yeah. the pressure of the growth of the system forcing a technocratic yeah. rationalization, yeah. but without the system giving up its claim to essentially supervising a vast portion of the yeah. minority population of our country yeah. with less and less. In the 90s, at least, we had high crime rates to, 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 to kind of make to that seem plausible. It. Now we've got historically yeah. low crime rates. And W and we're still all we're going to do is move people to and what we said then was the lower cost parts of the carceral state. And it's and it's just I, I mean and the uh, I mean the back in '92 I could have never predicted that actuarial justice would take off the way it has taken off. Now. Mm -hmm. Pick up a law review at random in this country, and there's going to be at least one article about wow. algorithms and how and with somebody claiming how they're going to solve the problem. You know, 
and just even 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 our attorney general, for, for all the good reasons, who who isn't who isn't going to be challenging the bail the, the bail administration here, um, says I won't do it because algorithms are going to solve our problem. Now I recently <coughs> wrote a piece in a, a little short piece in the New York Times something or other, and and my conclusion was that uh, that uh, that money bail is the worst form of pretrial release except for all others. And I sort of still half believe that. And algorithms are gonna are gonna are gonna are gonna make uh, first of all they'll be poorly administered and they're gonna make they're just gonna if they are implemented and I think they will be because millions of dollars. And now we have private contractors that are moving in to be promoting these things. It's gonna it's gonna transform And when you look at the levels of even if you buy which I may be willing to buy <coughs> that they're sort of getting really good at sort of sorting people into the high, medium, and risk categories. The high category means that, you know, 30% of those people are going to get rearrested during the bail period. Well, uh, you know, first of all, I'll, the fact that they're in the high category means that they're getting a lot more attention, so it may not be surprising that they're arrested more. But, I mean, that means 70% of them aren't. So the level of risk that we're sort of normalizing as high risk, you know, I think our willingness to um, imagine, this is where the populist peanut business and the kind of technocratic part are inseparable, because the level of sort of threat that will always be racially shaped by people's perception uh, of look, their communities is, you know. Look, I'm, 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 recent, I'm, I'm currently writing something now, a draft one, and I'm looking, I'm looking at bail administration now after 40 years of bail reform in the United States. And the one state that has embraced actuarial justice the most complete. It's not. It, it, it's not all that complete. But the most is the state of Virginia. They have a sentencing commission that's tried to create a risk predictions for all sorts, and they've gotten good people involved in it, including John Monahan, and, and so they're they're doing pretty good stuff. One of the interesting things I noticed is that the state of Virginia uh, incarcerates. The rate of incarceration of pretrial of, of, of pre, uh, the, the rate of pretrial detention is about 10 percent higher in Virginia than it is in most other places in the United States. Now, this is you, 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 the claim. The claim ought to be the claim of actuarial thinking ought to be ought to be 10 percent lower, and yeah. it's 10 percent higher. So, uh, so there are all sorts of reasons that would explain that, including judges failing to follow the recommendations. Yeah. But nevertheless. It's the system that has most completely embraced actuarial thinking for both pretrial release and sentencing, and in, and in terms of at least in terms of pretrial detention, it has it has. Uh, it, I can't say it's increased their rate because I don't know what it was back then. But when I've compared it to, to other jurisdictions in the country, it's higher, markedly higher. It's interesting that when we had a <laughs> local case recently, and just kind of a, be worth maybe writing something about this or investigating it. But there was a local instance in which somebody was. I guess given release on very low conditions or whatever, and then murdered a person, and, and the kind of thing we know is inevitable in any of these risks in any pretrial release system. But right away, you know, the the, the media focus on it, and the, the the answer from the justice reformers was not that this happens. It was oh well, there was a calculating error. You know, they claimed that it was just a technical problem that actually yeah. you know we would have rated him you know high if we had done it correctly. So. Um, it, I think it's a sign of how much pressure there will be around this um, computer problem. Well, well, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Our pleasure. Yeah. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. Well, thank you for your it's been a pressure. pressure. I'm sure Good this will uh, get us at least 5,000 yeah. more citations. Yeah, thanks yeah. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.